let's move on with uh, with this particular session, which is kind of bringing together a little of what we've been discussing in the past two sessions and also the uh, keynote addresses this morning. And that is, we are finally going to sort of try and have a little look at what a framework might look like post-2015. Um, any of you who've read the background document will see that um, we reference an interview that Mark Malak Brown did with the um, Guardian blog well, a couple of months ago, where he pointed out that the uh, creation and development of the Millennium Development Goals, at least uh, the, uh, the, the blueprint, was done pretty much by a very small team in the basement of the New York um, headquarters for, uh, for the UN. And uh, that small team created uh, a framework which has really guided international development um, for the past 13, and it will be 15 years. Uh, what, what has become really, really clear in, uh, in the time since then is that there is no way that some little small team could ever create such a framework again, at least in our modern era. And I, I want to here and now be, uh, be express my gratitude to Lawrence Haddad for actually putting into my head um, the, the idea of, uh, of this particular session because he came to visit us at the Lowy Institute last year and talked about the, the, the plurality of uh, the international development environment globally and uh, how difficult it is now to actually look at the way in which you can come together to get consensus on what might be the framework that replaces the Millennium Development Goals. It also reminds me of um, what has happened to the to the whole process of the aid effectiveness high level forums. I was in Rome, which was probably the genesis of the Paris, the Accra and the Busan agreements. And in Rome, we had a room probably three quarters the size of this with maybe a hundred people talking about aid effectiveness. Paris wasn't much bigger and uh, by 2011 with, uh, 2011 with Busan, <clears throat> you have something like 3,000 people and uh, a variety of different organisations, donors, recipients, private sector organisations, private philanthropic organisations, civil society, all talking about that that agenda. So the, the way in which the environment and the number of players has, has changed and expanded exponentially creates a real challenge, I think, for the world to get a consensus, but a consensus that is meaningful and constructive and will actually take the development agenda across down a pathway that is actually going to be fruitful for the largest number of people. Having such a um, multitude of players makes it extremely difficult. So what we want to do today is have a little look about at what the relevance of the, the post-2015 framework might be with particular reference to Asia-Pacific. You know, a framework that works for China and Vietnam, is that going to work for Tuvalu and Kiribati? Big question marks about that. Big question marks about whether it, even the existing framework uh, is, is relevant in the way it's been framed, uh, particularly indicators and targets for countries like Tuvalu versus countries like China. So we want to just have a little bit of a look now at post-2015. We've teased out quite a few of the issues in the past two sessions, but now I'm going to ask these four to look at it from different perspectives. Lawrence is going to give us a bit of a general overview of, of where the situation is at the moment and, and 
and where it's going. And then the others are going to come to it from their particular fields of expertise. So to begin with, uh, I'd like to, um, to, to ask Lawrence to, um, to get the discussion going. <clears throat> as in the previous sessions, hoping that people will stick to about 10 minutes each and then we'll have time for discussion um, before, before we close. Um, all of you can read, otherwise you wouldn't be here, and you can read all about Lawrence in your program. So here's Lawrence. <laughs> Shall I give you a few minutes to read about me, or shall I just, you know, I'll just, keep, I'll just start? Um, thanks, thanks, Anne Marie, and thank you for the thank you to the organisers. Uh, there was quite the, uh, quite an extraordinary introduction, Anne Marie. First of all, you said you're not a professor, are you? And then you said you're not a woman, and then you said you can read about him. And I'm just teasing. Um, the organisers, um, thank you for inviting me. Um, you'll be glad to know that this conference is is going to be burned into my brain for probably the rest of my life, for two reasons. One is the high quality of the presentations and the discussion. And second of all, this is where I was when Sir Alex Ferguson retired from Manchester United. <laughs> so I will remember this for a long time. Um, my exam question, which I now, I now find out that I was partially responsible for generating, uh, is um, to, to figure out the world's a lot more complex than it was, or it seems a lot more complex. It probably is, but it also seems a lot more complex than it was 15 years ago when the MDGs were being discussed and developed. And with so many more actors, and with such a more seemingly open process, um, how on earth are we going to achieve consensus on the post-2015 goals, and and what's the consequence of not achieving a consensus? So I think those are the, those are the easy questions I'm supposed to address. And like Warren, I can say I don't know the answer to these, um, but I'm going to give you some ideas that, that might be helpful in thinking about it. So first of all, the MDGs, they've been pretty successful. Um, I didn't think they would be so successful 15 years ago. It took about three years for them to actually puncture my consciousness. Um, I, when I first started hearing people talking about them, I, didn't, I thought there was another fashion fad and it wouldn't, they wouldn't last very long. Well, they have. They've, uh, the, if you look at the evaluations of them, um, the evaluations say they probably did increase the uh, ODA spend. They probably did target and direct more of it towards Africa. They probably, well, we definitely did target more of the ODA towards health. Um, they probably changed some of the narratives in, uh, around the policy space in some countries. And we know that, that many countries have actually adopted and adapted the MDGs uh, for national targets. So they have made a difference. Uh, and the fact that everyone's sort of in on the act this time around means that they must, they must, people must think they add value, they must matter. Mm -hmm. There wouldn't be so many websites and so many blogs and so many op-eds and so many conferences and so many papers written about the post-2015 settlement. So that's good, and, and as Anne-Marie said, um, they were, you know, kind of conceived in a, in a basement in, in New York somewhere, and I think they, they have a, they've sort of got a, what I like to call a, a singular coherence. Um, singular because it really was a, a narrowly defined set of interests that generated them, and a coherence because they, they, they were taken from the Millennium Declaration. Millennium Declaration was a, is a very coherent document. It blends all sorts of things, uh, uh, sort of uh, rights, uh, the environment, uh, human development. And the, the MDGs took a subset of, of, of those things and, and laid them out. Um, but the challenge really is to go from that singular coherence to a coherent plurality. And I think that's that's a really a difficult challenge. The coherent plurality, uh, plurality because there are so many different uh, actors and entities and organizations and interests in the development space, some of which call themselves development actors and, and many of them who don't. And it's the ones who don't call themselves development actors that are probably the more powerful and, influ and influential. Uh, so it's a plurality for those reasons. Um, and this plurality, it seems to me, has to um, generate a global vision. What's a coherent plurality? A coherent plurality is 
a set of interests that cohere around, I think, a, a global vision. So going from a millennium development goals to a set of global development goals, it has to be a, a set of goals that balance human rights, human poverty outcomes, and planetary management or you know, environmental issues. It has to balance those. And um, it has to go beyond aid and has to go beyond governments to a sort of a whole of society approach. So the MDGs were singular, they were coherent, but they're ultimately limited and limiting because they were only about those particular issues and they really just talked mostly about aid. And plus, they were mostly about the so-called developing countries. So, how to get there? Um, I've got no idea. But I think you, but I think you need some kind of uh, framework, some kind of um, journey, some, some kind of marker along a journey to get from singular um, coherence to coherent plurality. So I think there are kind of two stages in between those, those two things. Uh, and this is where I, I begin to get too clever by half, I'm afraid, and I'll probably get tongue-tied. But I think you go from singular coherence to stage two, which is kind of a singular cacophony. This is where everyone's saying the same thing, but loads of people are saying it. And I think, we, I think, you know, I think a lot of the MDG discussions 15 years ago were around this sort of singular cacophony. There were lots of, uh, lots of squabbles and battles and tussles around which indicator do we have for poverty and which indicator do we have for maternal mortality and um, which is it secondary education or primary education? Is it, is it uh, cognitive achievement or is it attendance and enrollment? These are all important debates, but they're ultimately second order debates. Everyone's sort of agreeing on the goals. They're just quibbling and squabbling over the indicators. So that's the second stage. I think the third stage is the one we're in right now, which is, uh, what, what did I call it? Pluralistic cacophony. So lots of different people saying lots of different things. I think that's where we are right now. I think the challenge is to go to a sort of a coherent plurality. So how are we going to get there? Well, there are, I can think of at least five processes that are ongoing that are trying to do this. They're trying to get from where we are now to some kind of coherence. Um, and we've heard about some of them. Um, we've heard about the high-level panel that's reporting to the Secretary General. I, when is it supposed to be? Is it, is it the next week or two? It's very soon, isn't it? Do we have a date? Are we sort of waiting around? No. Um, it's, anyway, it's very soon, and this is co-chaired by uh, Liberia, Indonesia, and, and the UK, and it has a, this eminent group of, of individuals working on it. Then there's the open working group uh, of, the, of UNGAS, the UN General Assembly, and uh, this is coming at it, I think, from a more SDG, Sustainable Development Goal, perspective. <coughs> then we've got the UNDP consultations. These are national level consultations and thematic ones, and I was, in, I was a, a participant of the food and hunger, the hunger and nutrition one uh, that the Rome agencies ran, and I was quite underwhelmed, actually, um, just because it ended up as sort of a very lowest common denominator kind of activity. Um, not really their fault. I don't, I don't know what I would have done differently if I was in their position. I think it's just a difficult thing. Then there are two others. Uh, one is my world, and... Um, uh, ODI is involved in that, and uh, other uh, two or three other organizations are involved in that. And that's a, a sort of a web-based web or, or, or um, social media-based activity that uh, lists about 15 or 16 priorities and says, and says to citizens um, all over the world, vote for these. Which ones do you think are the most important? And I think Alison was telling me about half a million people have, have voted already for that. Uh, and the things that are coming out, uh, I think the top three things are health, education, and an uh, honest and responsive government. So um, perhaps no, no real surprises there, but um, really kind of reassuring that, uh, for me it's reassuring because it, it says that people all over the world basically want the same things, uh, whether they are in rich countries or in, in poor countries. Um, and then the, the fifth thing is this is something called participate that uh, IDS is involved in uh, my institute, the Institute of Development Studies. Um, we're involved in it with um, a, a group of NGOs based in the UK and, and elsewhere called Beyond 2015. 
And that is working in 14 or 15 different countries with about 60 or 70 different groups. And that's the, the strap line for that is bringing voices from the margins into the debate. So that's working with uh, pastoralist groups, uh, groups, uh, youth groups, uh, dis disabled um, uh, veteran groups, groups that don't normally get heard in these kind of consultations. But, there, but I think all of these processes are, are, are helpful and, and they're all revealing, I think, things that um, some of the things we know, some of the things we don't know. The, the participate um, process is quite interesting. It's, it's focusing, if, if the my world is focusing on the what, the, I think the participate is, fo is focusing on the how. Uh, so some of the things that caught my eye uh, about it is it's, there, are, there are some very subtle barriers to to participation uh, and to um, to engagement in the in the in the policy process and the political process uh, in just being heard and um, the things we're hearing from the groups that are participating in this process are you know it's it's very subtle forms of discrimination often the discrimination is is encoded and embedded in rules and regulations for access to to certain programs often it's very implicit often it's completely overt but it's very, uh, it's very present for those people. Um, another thing we're hearing from Participate is that people feel that the pace of change is, whether it is speeding up or not, they feel that it's speeding up, and they feel that the fluidity and the dynamism is just making it very difficult to, to cope with shocks and hazards, but also to, to seize opportunities and even to participate. So some interesting things coming out. Um, but one commonality between my world and, and participate, these two processes, which are essentially civil society processes, um, the, one, the one commonality is a, uh, an honest and responsive government. Participate calls it um, uh, a, a, real, a real premium on trust and accountability. Um, without trust and accountability of a government, uh, there's a, there is a sort of a sense of hopelessness and cynicism and, well, it doesn't make a difference anyway, does it? And I think that that's really important. Uh, those of you who um, sort of um, listen to UK politics or US politics or even Pakistani politics will know that there's a real disenchantment with politicians at the moment. There's, there's a real, people feel like uh, you know, people are voting less. Uh, they feel like there's politicians, mainstream politicians have less and less to offer them. And I think this issue of, of trust and accountability is really vital. So, I'm nearly finished, Anne-Marie. So, how to get to a coherent plurality? I think there are sort of six, six things that I think these, these five processes um, are helping us with. I think the first thing is keep it simple. Um, keep the number of goals, whatever the number of goals are, keep it simple, keep the number small. If you want to be comprehensive, if you want to be... Um, if you want to have a big tent, don't do it around the goals so much. Do it around the indicators. Uh, if you want to bring, if you want to build alliances and bring people in, don't have millions of goals. You can have lots of indicators, uh, but don't have millions of goals. Number two, they have to be global. These 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 goals have to be global goals. That why do they have to be global? Because the previous session was one uh, indicator of that. Um, international public goods, global public goods. So many of the issues of today will only be resolved through global collective action. So they have to be global in that sense. They also have to be global in the sense that, um, you know, the, there used to be this, this expression that um, problems with the mon monopoly of the developing countries and solutions with the monopoly of the developed countries. Well, that was never true, uh, but it's even less true now. I mean, many policy solutions are coming from uh, the, the countries in the south, the BRICS, the, the emerging countries, even the poorest countries, and they're being adopted in the, in the richer countries. So there's a, a massive amount of uh, commonality in terms of the issues, but also in terms of the solutions. So they have to be global, that's number two. There has to be a whole of society approach, number three. Um, we have to go beyond aid, we have to go beyond government. So that's why we've got uh, there's, there's someone going to, who's going to talk about business, the role of business, the role of civil society, the role of science, the role of the media, the role of IT. Uh, e everyone, all of society has a role to play, and I think we're just waking up to that. It always was the case, but I think we're just waking up to that. Uh, we, being us in the development community, are waking up to that. 
Um, fourth, I think there has to be a real, we have to be really tolerant about uh, and really open about the need to have a plurality of journeys. So even if the goals are global goals, even if the indicators are, there may be some, there may be some differentiation of goals and differentiation of, differentiation of responsibilities and different targets for different indicators for different countries. But there, there will be a commonality around the goals and the indicators, I, I think. But there has to be, uh, we can't make a, there be a, a commonality in terms of journeys towards those goals. We have to, um, the mantra of go your own way, find your own way, um, there's no blueprint, there's no cookie, cookie cutter approach. We have to be really tolerant to that. And more than tolerant, we have to embrace it and celebrate that. And, and, and crucially learn across those different stories. Number five is something that came up, it hasn't come up much today actually, and that's politics. Um, uh, last night, uh, in her talk, Alison said, uh, you know, we mustn't politicize aid, and I, I, I agree with that. Um, um, but in many, in many agencies, there's, there's a completely apolitical perspective on aid, a very techni technocratic perspective on aid. And this is sort of a rational planner, um, Everything, we, we live in a certain world where markets work perfectly. Well, we don't. We live in an uncertain world. Markets work very imperfectly if they exist at all. Information is incomplete and asymmetric. And power is unevenly distributed. And when you have so many actors and agencies and entities, they all have different interests. And so you have to understand the politics and you have to embrace the political analysis of this. They all, uh, they, these, these different groups have... They will contest, they will negotiate, they will fight, they will, ha they will have conflicts, uh, and sometimes they will come together uh, with a meeting of the minds. And so a political, political analysis and a political perspective is, is vital, it seems to me, if you're going to forge this coherent plurality. And finally, accountability. Um, when there are so many actors involved, uh, there, is, there are power dis differences between them. There are op differences in terms of the opacity, the opaqueness, uh, some of them have to be highly accountable, some of them don't have to be accountable, whether they're philanthropists or governments or, or businesses, there's varying and civil society, there's varying degrees of opacity and I think accountability mechanisms are going to be really important. So the indicators not, do not only have to be about goals and outcomes, they also have to be about commitments and inputs. What did you do? How can I hold you to account? What did you do to um, enable or, or disable a particular goal? So um, that's, that's where I come out. Those, those five processes are going to be helpful. There, there, there need to be more. I think there are some ways to, um, to make a coherent plurality a, a likelier event. Finally, my final reflection is what's the consequence of not of not succeeding. I think the consequences are grave indeed. We kind of think that we will go from a millennium development set of goals to a global set of goals uh, and that that will happen and it's just a question of what do the global goals look like. Well our record on multilateralism and on collective action is not brilliant and it hasn't been brilliant for the last 10 years. So there's no reason to think that we actually will end up with a very coherent set of goals I had a, you know, as, as you do, I, had a, I tried to talk to as many people outside of the development world as I possibly can. Um, and I've got lots of friends who don't, who don't know anything about development. And I was going to do an interview um, about the, the development goals. And I was talking to one of my friends about, about this beforehand. And uh, she said to me, so if the Millennium Development Goals are so great, why do you have to change them? You know, why do you have to have a new set of goals? And it was, a, it was a really good question. Um, and I think, you know, citizens who are not in our development bubble, and we often do talk to each other and only to each other, they are going to be looking to, to people like us uh, to come up with a, a credible set of goals that they can understand, that work for everyone, and that everyone can contribute to. So if we don't come up with a, a, a coherent plurality, it's going to be a real, real train wreck and, uh, and we will be partially accountable for it. So on that rather gloomy note, I'll end. Thank you. Thanks very much, Lawrence. 
Um, and now I'm going to ask Professor Unmi Kim to, to speak, particularly from, uh, from the Asian perspective. Those of you who had an opportunity to, um, to hear Unmi speak last night um, will, uh, will no doubt be very pleased to be hearing from her again. And those of you who didn't, a treat's in store. So Unmi, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Anne-Marie, for that uh, kind introduction. I look forward to participating and hearing uh, from the audience about uh, all the discussions that we've had today. Uh, I would like to talk about the post-2015 uh, development challenges coming from the Asian perspective. Uh, I'll skip this. Uh, first of all, before I uh, go into what I think are challenges that stem out of this region, um, I want to touch back upon what Larry was talking about in terms of diversity of journeys. And maybe I'll start from the diversity of journeys that we found in Asia, because clearly the Washington consensus of trying to find one way that fits everyone uh, is now uh, completely dead. And I hope the nails in the coffin were put down quite soundly so it doesn't pop up again. Um, so let me share what I think are some crucial aspects of Asian development cooperation that stems largely from our own experience of development and rapid industrialization. First of all, many of the development partners or uh, donors or South-South cooperation providers of Asia have their own experience of being a recipient of, of development assistance for a very long time. And another thing that comes out of this experience is that from the very beginning, many of the, the countries, even when we were receiving huge amounts of aid, we're always uh, providing assistance to others. We are participating in technical cooperation. So even for South Korea, which came out of the Korean War in 1953, uh, as early as 1963, only 10 years after that, we were participating in a technical cooperation project with USAID. And that same story is replicated in China, India, all parts of Asia. So when we talk about development partner, it's not just the euphemistic uh, word, but we really mean it. We really mean development partnership because even when you are receiving aid, we've always been trying to give, in particular, to countries uh, next to us. So the second issue that I uh, talk about in my slide here is um, regional development. Uh, we have been using ODA for building regional economic relationships and development in Asia. We have always uh, focused a lot of our attention on Asia, and I'll uh, show you some figures. And thirdly, a, a point that I raised yesterday as well, we are seeing ODA as part of a much larger uh, comprehensive development stimulus package. ODA is very minuscule compared to some of the other uh, foreign capital flows in Asia. The conference that I'm organizing in a few weeks' time in Korea is called Asian Solutions to Asian Problems uh, with a question mark. In terms of diversity of journeys, we also have diversity in terms of how we can provide for each other. Let me share with you some, some statistics, quite a few. To, uh, but uh, the, the takeaways that I want you to take away from this is that uh, among the different types of capital flows, I didn't have remittances, which I think is quite sizable. But if you look at the, 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 the volumes, we see that trade is by and large the largest in terms of capital flows in, in the world, and in, in particular in this part of the world. And you can see that the Asia share is quite high for China. And Japan and Korea is, is a lot lower. But in the past, it, was, uh, it could have been higher. The other thing that I want you to take away from this is that um, the share of their interest in Asia, and particularly if you look at ODA, the Asia share is significantly high for Korea. It's about 50%, but in the 2011 figures, we're showing about 47%. Japan is 225 but it was much larger in the 70s and 80s. So we've had a very strong regional uh, development interest. In China, we hear a lot about uh, Chinese investment. Uh, in, no, this is a Freudian slip, I think. Chinese South-to-South -South cooperation, which includes many things other than what we traditionally call foreign aid. Um, 
we hear that a lot of it goes to, to Africa at the tune of over 60% of what they provide, but it's also very interesting to see over 30% in Asia. And um, in Professor Sun's presentation, we saw some uh, the countries that are receiving it, and also in Professor Mullen's um, uh, figures, we saw which countries Chinese aid was going as well. So I want you to take away these figures to see that many of the Asian uh, donors or South-South or development, uh, co development partners have focused on a regional development because poverty was with us for a very long time. Some of us was able to graduate. Others are still struggling and we're, we know what it's like and we can share some of the experiences that we've had in this region. Finally, to the Asia's post-2015 cha uh, development challenges. This comes from the research that we have been conducting. I think there are three gaps in the development cooperation discussions in the, the MDGs, and I sort of offer these three uh, sets of issues. The first one is, um, this sort of stems from our um, frustration uh, that when I look at the development cooperation literature, much is about European donors and sub-Saharan African recipients, countries, and very little has been uh, uh, researched about Asian donors or Asian recipients. So we were quite frustrated, so we're accumulating more cases out of, uh, uh, out of Asia. What we found is uh, when we try to understand uh, the nexus between security, human security, and development, development cooperation. Very little has been researched in, in Asia. But in fact, many of the countries in Asia that face poverty are also countries that are in war, have been in war, have been in conflict. So we wanted to understand how countries in fragile situations uh, that they face triple challenges of human insecurity, underdevelopment, and poverty can solve these problems. And we're trying to look at some of the successful Asian countries as well as obstacle cases to learn more about how to do this. Because we feel very strongly that uh, bridging security and development, the development cooperation, is a critical issue that MDGs didn't deal with. And I think in the post-MDG uh, world, we must deal with this issue. Second is uh, we have been working with people uh, in the field. And by and large, the, the people who work in the humanitarian assistance field have said uh, when there are natural disasters, and we have seen quite a few of the natural disasters uh, in uh, this part of the world, more so than other parts of the world for, for reasons that I think the scientists among us could teach me, but which I don't know. But I just look at the number of incidents and number of casualties, and it's uh, by and large, uh, we, we see the, the high occurrence of natural disasters in this part of the world. What we have heard from the field is that uh, short-term humanitarian assistance teams and the long-term development cooperation teams are different. They don't seem to talk to each other. As one group leaves, another group comes in uh, without much dialogue and constructive um, cooperation. So short-term disasters exacerbate <coughs> existing poverty and insecurity, and they become long-term poverty and security cases. Just building it up to the pre-disaster the, uh, the pre, uh, disaster level is probably not enough. We need to go beyond that. And since this is a severe issue faced by Asian countries as well as Pacific Island countries, I think this is a very important issue that we need to tackle together. Finally, um, as we have looked at the Asian development experience, it has always been about building domestic institutions, building domestic capacity, and building domestic um, empowerment. So what I find very lacking is the gender inequality still remaining a challenge. Improvements in gender development, education, employment has not really led to gender empowerment, which we think are critical for development to proceed. So uh, concerted efforts, I think, are needed to improve gender empowerment for, for sustainable development and poverty reduction. To use um, uh, President Drew Faust of Harvard when she visited IHUAM, uh, was it last month, two months ago in March, she said, uh, educating women has, is fair, smart, 
and transformative of societies. And without, I think somebody else was talking about six-cylinder car and only three cylinders working. So we want all six cylinders to go full steam ahead. And I think uh, gender issue has to be uh, has to be incorporated. And it hasn't. It's not just about providing more opportunities, but really empowering them so that they can change themselves, their societies, and their communities. So. The domestic capability development is what I think we need to think about, and it's not just about em employment, but it's about education, employment, and empowerment, the three E's, that I think would lead to sustainable development. So I give you some food for thought. Thank you. Thanks very much, um, Unmi. And now I'd like to ask Helen Zoki if she would come and give the perspective from civil society slash NGO in terms of the post-2015 development agenda. Thank you, Helen. Um, thanks very much. Second last speaker for the day. I'm inclined to make you all stand up, jump around, and but I won't. I won't do that. Um, thanks very much, Graeme, and your colleagues for the opportunity to speak at this conference. And I, I actually would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land and to paying respects for, uh, to elders past and present. And for those of you who weren't there last night, you missed the most whimsical bit of Yun Mi's presentation, which was that in the 60s, I think Korea was the major exporter of wigs in the world, which is the most astonishing fact that I just can't let go of. I'm sorry. Um, I am here, and I feel very honoured to be here so early in my term as the Chief Executive of Oxfam Australia to give a perspective from the um, civil society and particularly from the international NGO sector. And I do that coming from a, um, an organisation that has a very broad footprint in terms of the range of activities that we do. And hearing some of the presentations today, and I guess reflecting back on my own question and some of the references that, that have been made about politics, I think... Um, perhaps some of the work we do is, is useful to put into this discussion in a very specific sense. And I think um, the, the other reflection I'd make just, you know, in trying to process all of the really incredible presentations today is that um, we have to keep reminding ourselves, I guess, that the purpose of development is about people um, and as well as about resources and as well as about, I guess, power and politics and you know, all of the kind of variations of that. And um, and I think that's one of the real um, privileges, I guess, of that I feel of coming to an organisation like Oxfam, which is very much connected with people at all sorts of different levels. So we've heard a lot about the challenges today. And um, from our perspective at Oxfam, um, those uh, there's a lot of overlap in those uh, challenges. I think uh, perhaps one that hasn't been mentioned at, at quite so specifically today and specifically in the Asia-Pacific region, uh, we've talked about population growth, but I think we also need to look at the issue of the demographics of that population growth and the, and the youth quake, so the kind of, you know, the wave of young people that are coming through. And again, last night there was a reflection on um, some of the, the good results that have been achieved in response to issues around universal education. But if we think about the flow-on effects of this youth quake, then what are these young people going to do? Where are they going to go and work? How are they going to make a contribution? So certainly population uh, numbers is a, is a really important issue from our perspective. And what we, we already know is that in some of these countries, what that might lead to is, in fact, the increase in low-paid jobs. And if we're, I guess if we look at the issues around global trade and so on, and if we think about some of these issues from a rights-based perspective and we reflect on what has happened most immediately in Bangladesh, where we've seen now over 1,000 people um, killed in a, um, a factory um, accident who were all garment producers who may or may not have been being paid a living wage and who may or may not have been um, providing uh, goods to uh, Western um, clothing companies and other Western companies, then for me I think the, you know, the, the kind of the down the supply chain of issues that we need to think about are um, what happens in unregulated markets and also what the responsibility of some of those countries are that receive aid or who are part of our, our trading partnerships, uh, what obligations they bring to the table in terms of uh, protecting their own people. We've already heard about the stampede of rural populations migrating to urban centres 
and uh, the, the, the full range of, I guess, challenges that that will bring. We've uh, talked a lot about gender inequality, um, deep, and that's deeply rooted in most countries across the region. And um, from my recent past where I've worked in a domestic human rights environment, I'd say that we still haven't quite got it right in Western countries either. So, you know, I think there's a real issue in terms of the broad spectrum around gender equality. We've heard some very um, compelling presentations around climate change, and we would agree with those. And what we also know is that there will be fierce competition for land and water and mineral resources. And uh, we, we already see that even in some of those very positive stories around regional cooperation and uh, Oxfam's involved in the Mekong area, that there are real challenges around the most vulnerable communities in those areas around access to ward, food and water. And we've heard about uh, uh, natural disasters. So, I mean, all of that's pretty grim. And... Um, uh, but I think our job is is to be pretty, you know, sort of solutions focused. And I think the framework that uh, um, that Lawrence has given us to start with is um, is a helpful way to think about how we find our way through that path. And and I have to say, coming new into Oxfam and being part of, I guess, the non-government sector, these are all things that we're thinking about. You know, what is our unique contribution in terms of trying to address some of these issues? What is the role that we can play as one of those actors that may be very different to the role of governments or the role of um, banks or international foundations? Um, so we certainly agree, tackling inequality and ensuring economic growth and trade um, is actually geared to benefiting the poorest of the poor is one of the things that really, I suppose, drives our work in terms of what we try to do. Um, we continue to prioritise gender equality uh, and to build the resilience of poor and vulnerable communities. We've got a focus, I guess, on climate change and, and adaptation and the issues around managing our natural resources fairly. Uh, and coming at that, for, I guess, from a human rights-based approach, I mean, looking at what that means in terms of not only what we do in our work, but how we do it, how we actually engage with partners on the ground. And I think the other important part of what um, organisations, civil society organisations and non-government organisations can do is to actually advocate for change in different ways to, to perhaps what some of the other players can do. And I think that advocacy for change is as important in our own countries as it is in the international um, context and in the international world. Uh, and uh, again, I want to talk a little bit about uh, what we do in that space. So um, in terms of the answers to the challenges, I'm only three and a half months into the job, so I don't have to give you answers, I don't think. But uh, I, I would reiterate um, some of the comments that have been made. Uh, what we know is that some of these challenges do, many of these challenges require global solutions. And we know that multilateral organisations are critical but are clunky and are bogged down and there's more work that has to be done in that uh, space. We know that regional organisations will also play an important role and we've heard a lot about that and I'm not going to revisit that too much at the moment. We know there's a need to uh, finance development through a range of sources and we also know that national governments will have a pivotal role and I think, that, again, that that's a critical challenge that we have in terms of some of the partnerships or some of the work that we do in countries overseas. And uh, for me, I guess, I, this struck me quite acutely when I um, had my first field trip to Sri Lanka, which of course is a country that has enormous interest to Australia for a multiplicity of reasons. It's a country that's come out of war, but perhaps, uh, if I can put it delicately, is, is increasingly militarised in terms of how it's approaching things. And Oxfam has a long tradition of working in that country, working with uh, domestic civil society organisations on the ground. And there were just two observations I made. The first is going to see one project where we did, we did some terrific work with local communities around dealing with floods and you know, the process of communities deciding what they wanted built there and what processes they wanted in place to actually help them cope with the inevitability of floods. But then to find that notwithstanding all of the impacts of climate change and what will happen in terms of perhaps trying to deal with floods, one of the biggest causes of a flood is an upstream dam that when, it, when the rains do come and, and it breaches is inevitably going to have water flowing down that's going to wash away bridges that were built 18 months before. And I guess that issue of what, are the, what is the kind of plan 
and responsibility of national governments to mitigate some of this, um, this risk that uh, very vulnerable communities are exposed to. And the other was to actually visit one of our trading partners. We have a fair trade um, um, arm to our business and, and had this experience of going to see this beautiful biodynamic organic farm in the middle of Sri Lanka um, uh, who meets all of the fair trade requirements in terms of um, appropriate pay for agricultural workers and remuneration for producers and thinking about what role they could play in a country like Sri Lanka where, human, where the human rights footprint is constricting to perhaps leverage from a private sector point of view to provide a different voice to government. You know, we're offering something to this country, we're exporting from this country, but what's the political influence we can bring to bear to try to loosen up those human rights abuses? Um, just in terms of, I guess, the other players, um, the opportunities like this are important and, and we've already talked about the private sector. Um, I just want to reflect on a couple of things we've done that I think are, are helpful in the context of looking ahead in relation to um, aid and development, and it's, an, it's, a, it's a broad church of ideas. Uh, the first is thinking about the private sector in all sorts of um, different ways, not just in terms of the private sector, I guess, being part of the, the resourcing of what happens in relation to development. And I hope that many of you will know that Oxfam globally had recently launched a campaign called Behind the Brands, where it looked at the top 10 food producers of the world and rated their policies against a range of criteria, which included remuneration to workers, um, uh, um, the, the, the remuneration to farmers, gender issues, sustainability issues in terms of agriculture. And they took a particular, we took a particular focus on cocoa workers who are often women who are often very poorly paid. Um, and the campaign was launched and it was, you know, described as a, a rise to the top rather than a name and shame. There was a lot of consultation with the companies at the international level to indicate why we were doing this work, issues around food security, um, you know, the protection, I guess, of human rights, looking at the total supply chain. And out of that campaign ca has already come a commitment from Nestle, Mars and Cadbury's parent company, Mondelez, to actually tackle the inequality facing women farmers and workers in their supply chains. So I guess it's an example of where it's not only direct aid but also advocacy can actually make a difference and that the private sector can play a really important role in leveraging and maybe that's a good segue for your talk in a minute, I hope. Um, so for organisations like ours, I guess we think that we have a really fundamental role to play in tackling the systemic drivers of poverty and equality and um, I can say that Oxfam's had a very proud history in playing that role. But... Um, uh, and, and so we think that civil society generally is a really important actor. It's actually the communities that have power to elicit action by other development actors. It's the communities that can influence public institutions um, and uh, as active citizenship. And, and it's also the community that can go to the private sector and to put pressure on them to be um, ethical in terms of how they operate. Um, and we're seeing that increasingly, I think, in all sorts of... Um, consumer markets. And it's also the communities that have the power to demand transparency and participation in the management of their natural and financial resources. Um, and last night you and me talked about um, the experience of Korea and the example of how recipient countries really want to have a say on what their own priorities is. And I would take that down to the next level and say that recipient communities also want to have a say in how development is provided or what resources are brought into their communities. And I think that's very much the model that Oxfam operates on and working with partner organisations. Um, so in our experience, development actors are, um, with divergent interests can collaborate uh, effectively and uh, I just want to close, I guess, with a couple of examples of, of, of work that we've been involved in, which isn't, again, directly around a straight line to development, but is actually looking at the sort of goals around alleviating policy, uh, po po poverty sorry, uh, in a very unsettled world. So Oxfam worked very closely, in fact, with the Australian Government to help secure the passage of the world's first arms trade treaty 
through the United Nations General Assembly last month. And that's important in terms of the whole impact of armed trade on vulnerable communities and particularly its impact on uh, women and families. And uh, that treaty, we hope, will be signed in the next, uh, in June, I think, the first week of June by the countries that supported it. And hopefully will have an important role to play in trying to deal with the fragility of many parts of the world as we know it today. Next week, we'll actually partner with the Melbourne Business School to host our annual Sustainable Mining Symposium. And this is, again, another example of working with the extractive industries to look at issues about the mutual obligations of what happens not only in terms of the use of natural resources, but issues around ownership of land, the rights of people who work in those industries, and what happens, I guess, in a more regional sense. On the academic front, we already have a... Um, uh, rich and robust research partnership with Monash and we look to developing that with um, the NOSL, we hope, and uh, other institutions uh, in the future. Um, and I think, um, you know, that the, they're examples of how, uh, as a sector, we can't afford to be inward looking. We actually have to reach out to get various points of views. And I think the comment that you made about actually talking to your friends who aren't in the development world is a really important um, comment because I have to tell you someone coming in this world has more acronyms than any other world I've ever known uh, but it's it's such critical work and it's important to actually get a simple understanding of the depth and the sophistication of that. So I just want to finish with one of our stories about how multiple actors can make a difference and um, this is before my time but it's a story two years ago a community of women's groups in Java, Indonesia asked one of Oxfam partners organisations to help them understand more about a planned oil field in Block Sipu, I think it is. And flowing from this, an open dialogue was initiated with the oil companies and soon after the local and provincial governments were invited to participate in that dialogue. This process has led to a profit share agreement for the oil fields revenue and while the percentage of revenue going to the local and provincial government is small, it has the potential to increase the total budgets of two provinces by eightfold. The agreement stipulates that the revenue can be used, what it can be used for, and that it must benefit local women. And of course, monitoring the agreement and ensuring strong redress mechanisms will be critical to its effectiveness in the future. So that's one small example, I guess, of some of the work on the ground that's done. Uh, and uh, I, I hope that it at least sort of opens the debate up a little bit in terms of what the role of civil society will be, and I'll look forward to more comments and questions from my colleagues in the audience. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Helen. And now I'd like to, um, to ask Mark to, to look at the way in which the private sector and in particular business can, can support development and the views of or the way in which um, private sector slash business can be part of the post-2015 agenda. Mark. Thank you very much, Anne-Marie, and uh, for the privilege of speaking to you all. I'm going to try and cover five topics in 10 minutes, so... Let's see if I'm up for the challenge. Uh, what I want to do, number one, is talk about a brief history of our organisation because I think it's an interesting little story of what we've done in five years as a microcosm of what's happening in terms of business engagement with development. Then I want to talk about a couple of prophetic voices from the past that are now realising in reality what's happening today, those voices are now evident in how the world functions. Third element is convergence trends, which seems to be a theme amongst all of us, uh, as something that's clearly evident, which is the fourth dimension, some elements of evidence for convergence. And finally, some recent examples with some of those companies on Helen's list of brands and what they're now doing under the pressure from society to change the way they do business. Uh, so first of all, a brief history of b md We were spawned out of World Vision in 2007, really as an experiment on what could be done to partner with companies in Australia. We had a summit in 2008, a little bit like this, a little bit larger. We invited businesses to come. We got the rock stars. We got Jeffrey Sachs. We got Wolfinson, former head of the World Bank. We had Jenny Brockie. 
not doing as good a job as moderating as our current moderator, but we had a stellar cast, and so we expected stunning results. Well, uh, although we got a good number, I had one company respond, send me a one sentence email. It was the head of oil search in Papua New Guinea, who said, I wrote down everything that you presented and all your speakers presented, come to Papua New Guinea uh, and let's see what we can do in this country. Now that one spark has led to a whole sequence of activities and I'll come back to that. 2008 was of course before the global financial crisis. We thought what's going to happen to our little fragile organisation uh, post GFC? Pleasantly surprised the environment fundamentally changed and no longer could companies be seen to tokenistically window dress what they were doing in the developing world because hard questions were now being asked about how companies behave. We brought Mohammed Yunus, the Nobel Peace Laureate to Australia. All of a sudden, 3,000 people around the country come to hear him speak on the idea of social business, how you use profit to generate development impact. We then had a very large project in Papua New Guinea. I won't name and shame uh, the company that worked with us that then walked away during changing uh, business environment, but we were getting close to seeing the realization of what we all dreamed could be done. I will tell you at the end of the 10 minutes a couple of stories of what we're doing today, which really excites us and illustrates how things have changed in a very short period of time. Secondly, let me talk about the two prophetic voices. One is quite recent. In 2005, Bjorn Stigson, the head of the World Business Council for a Sustainable Development, said, by 2050, 85% of the world's population of around 9 billion will be in developing countries. If these people are not engaged in the marketplace, our companies cannot prosper. The benefits of the global market will not exist Clearly, it's in our mutual interest to help societies shift to a more sustainable path. This was 2005. It's prophetic because what has happened is that as markets that are mature in the West falter, the markets in the developing world are where companies are heading in their droves to make their margins for their shareholders and engaging with the base of those economies where the world's human latent potential exists in vast quantities. The other prophetic voice, and, and so there's, there's a prophetic market driver for where business is now heading. A, a lot older voice, Franklin D. Roosevelt in 1933, envisioned a, a social driver for business, which I think now exists. He said, the measure of the restoration, of course, after the Depression, lies in the extent to which we apply social values more noble than mere monetary profit. Happiness lies not in the mere possession of money. It lies in the joy of achievement and the thrill of creative endeavor. The joy and moral stimulation of work must no, must, uh, no longer must be forgotten in the mad chase of evanescent profit these dark days will be worth all they cost us if they teach us that our true destiny is not to be ministered unto, but to minister to ourselves and our fellow men. There is wide and pervasive social pressure among consumers on companies, food companies in particular, extractives also, and other industries to say, how are you serving humanity? I want to know what's at the bottom of the supply chain of what I'm buying and how you're treating those people in your supply chain. The third element that I want to now talk about is some of the convergence trends which are now evident. Business is now everywhere. In any village in Africa, you've got people with mobile phones, they're interacting with mobile banking, they get farming information from their phones, 5 billion mobile phones on the planet, only 1 billion of those used in the developed, so-called developed world. NGOs and government now concede it's not an option as to whether to collaborate with business. It's a present reality. The so-called base of the economic pyramid, 
variously defined by roughly three or four billion people on Earth, earning less than US 1500 a year, is the world's greatest uh, untapped, largely unexplored marketplace for the private sector. And technology is enabling interactions to take place with great rapidity. The evidence of convergence is appearing everywhere. IFC, of course, part of the World Bank, has spent around 10 billion US collaborating with about 200 companies on what is called inclusive business, which is essentially intentional mutual benefit between companies making profit and underdeveloped communities coming out of poverty. That's a lot of money, and that's in the last decade. United Nations Development Program has a division called Business Call to Action. We engage closely with them. They've got now about 80 to 100 signatories of companies signing up to say, yes, we'll do inclusive business. We'll redesign how we do business. Professor Michael Porter, Harvard University, most people will know of his idea of creating shared value, which is, again, very similar to the notion of inclusive business. The thought leadership, the practical expenditure of donor funds, uh, it's a present reality and it's expanding rapidly. Finally, some of our practical learnings back to our humble little organization and what we've done in the past few years. We've learned that talk fests, while useful, don't help us get companies changing their behavior. So what we've done is handheld companies, or more like grabbed them by the throat, and said to them, we're going to work with you by hook or crook to help you do better engagement with your farmers particularly, and I'll talk about two uh, uh, food companies, very large food companies. The first one is Kraft, which is now renamed, or in the process of being renamed, Mondelez, who I'm glad responded to Oxfam's criticisms. And they also responded to the fact that they've largely been at a distance from their farmers and haven't directly engaged with smallholder producers of cocoa uh, through their uh, value chain around the world. They're now disintermediating traditional trading companies and their new mantra is getting close to their source or getting close to their farmers. So we have an initiative with them in Papua New Guinea that will see a doubling of the income of the farmers. They're building a foundation that improves health and education for those farmers. They've never done this before. It's unprecedented for them. It's because of the kind of pressures and convergence that's happening today. The second is PepsiCo, uh, which is actually America's largest food and beverage company now. Their food division is larger than their beverages. Uh, Fred O'Leary or Smith's Chips in Australia is a division that we've worked on in Myanmar, uh, which is opening up rapidly. We've had two visits now to Shan State, and uh, beautiful, fertile, underutilised part of the world in terms of growing conditions. And uh, anyone who knows history well knows that that country was really the breadbasket of Asia in the past. Uh, so. Pepsi know they can't work with current brokers and aggregators that operate with extreme lack of transparency and exploitation for farmers. So they're looking to, for a way, as a large listed company of 280,000 employees, how they can do that responsibly and also make commercial gain. So we're helping look at how they design that. And uh, let me conclude with this remark that there is, we believe, a real role for NGOs, brokers, collaborators uh, to work with the private sector and with government to help companies solve these kind of issues. So I'll leave it there. Thanks very much, Mark. And um, we have a few minutes for, for questions and discussions. So, yes, first one here. Uh, 
Um, thanks, Anne Marine, for the panel. I'm Nastar and Jafari, Education and Emergencies for um, Asia and the Pacific. Um, really, just wanted to touch on um, Unmi's um, comment on um, the humanitarian development divide. It was just a question of how do you think of we can bridge that? Because it's a very good point. I understand this is a development platform, but the humanitarian community we're now trying to remove, as you know, from the dichotomy um, of this traditional um, distinction, and as humanitarian needs development and vice versa. Um, in particular with DR and education and working with both the soft side, so for example, DR and curriculum, but also reconstruction as well. When um, you alluded to Bangladesh, it's also to do with the structures, as you know, and the building codes that you talked about last night as well, and the importance of making sure that we work together and not separately anymore because that's just not working anymore and going through preparedness and capacity building um, as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, I think uh, in terms of how to find the, the, the connection point between humanitarian assistance and long-term development cooperation, one very important way to do that is, is with natural disasters. Uh, if you look at uh, international humanitarian assistance, for example, they talk about the four pillars of life-saving um, uh, issues, but they don't talk about education, right? And education is sort of my pet project, not because I'm at a university. Uh, I, I'm, I'm really shocked to learn that professors are not highly respected <laughs> in, in Australia who come to Korea. Um, <laughs> um, and if we take a more long-term perspective in international humanitarian assistance, when we go to refugee camps, to bring some normalcy to the children who have to be in the refugee camp, if you bring education as one element, I think that's a way to... Uh, to engage both communities. And I think education can be a very vital force in, in making sure that when the, the refugee camps are gone, the children ten, then can be uh, put back into schools and can lead more or less a normal life. And this is related to the, the youth soldiers and so on. So a lot of these issues, if you have a more long-term perspective, when you build refugee camps, there are things that you need to put there uh, put in there to help the transition. And likewise, in the, the long-term development community, if they're able to work with the international humanitarian assistance short-term uh, solutions, uh, short-term uh, uh, programs, um, if we are more in, uh, uh, because in the humanitarian assistance, sometimes we think about uh, bringing it up to the level, to the pre-disaster level, but it is very important to see the pre disaster poverty levels and what needs to be done. So when natural disasters occur, uh, if we can use that as an opportunity to really help address some fundamental problems that exacerbated their conditions in natural disasters, I think that's a, that's a way to, to bridge the gap between the two. Thank you for that question. Oh. Uh, Jeffrey Cho, a PhD student from the Australian National University. Uh, my question goes to uh, Professor Kim and me and also Helen. Uh, uh, recent years, the uh, donor country like uh, Australia and uh, Korea is emphasizing that the uh, emphasizing uh, more uh, environment from the uh, from CSOs and develop, uh, uh, development NGOs in the uh, aid policy making. So in the case of Korea, we have a, now you are having a kind of official channel that allows uh, CSO's uh, environment in the aid policy making. But the, when you look at the uh, reality of uh, 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 certain aid policy uh, deliberation, uh, uh, it seems that the, uh, uh, the CSOs and NGOs are having difficulty to put their agenda effectively in the aid policy making process. So, Oh, how can he improve this kind of a situation? Thank you. Um, I, don't, I don't know quite where to start with the answer to that. I, I think um, uh, if, I, if I reflect on the role of uh, Oxfam in Australia, then I think... Um, uh, and this is a self-evident truth, that we have an important role to play both in terms of, I guess, acknowledging the good things that 
Australia does as an international citizen and remarking on the things that they don't do so well. And I mean, this is an interesting discussion at this time where uh, next week is a federal budget, so we'll see what the strength of the current government's commitment is in, a, in relation to um, uh, overseas development, where we've seen, um, I guess, the manipulation of the aid budget so that Australia as a country is actually now the third largest recipient of its own aid money to deal with the refugee issue. Um, uh, so, you know, they're, they're the, the, the challenging things. And, um, and your survey that talked about um, the crisis of confidence in political leaders, I think it's, it's, um, I think there's, to some extent that's what we're experiencing in, the, in this country as well. So I think that the, the particular and specific role that we can play within our own countries is to, um, I guess, strengthen the arm of the role that our countries can play in the international arena. Um, and then the, I guess the, the role that we play in other countries is very much about working through civil society organisations to, um, I guess, so that they have the capacity to be that voice in their own country. And again, I, you know, I have very little field experience compared to everyone else in this room, but I reflect on, um, you know, just how challenging and sensitive that is in a country like Sri Lanka. Um, you know, spent some time in Vietnam and then, you know, understanding the presentations about, around the, the Mekong River project and, and how much kind of diplomacy it takes to actually um, get agreement around particular issues in, in relation to the protection of a vital source that, you know, has an impact on millions of people through the Mekong areas, through all of those countries and so on. Um, I th I, so I, you know, it's the obvious answer that it's a, it, it ebbs and wanes depending on where the, you know, what I would call the window the, the windows of opportunity are to have an impact and to, to you know, make a difference. And um, sometimes that's very public and that's good, but sometimes, as you know, being public is not so helpful. Uh, and I think that the important role that we can play is that we can at least continue to build the, the capacity, work with people to build their capacity in some of those countries where it's not as possible for them to have visibility and a human voice so that they, there is a resilience there for when those opportunities come in their own place. Uh, thank you for that question. That's a million dollar question that I don't think I have all the right answers, but let me just say three things very briefly. Uh, first of all, I think uh, we in the civil society, we in the academia have been pressing the the South Korean government, that the government shouldn't just complain that the NGOs are not ready, the Korean NGOs are not ready to go into the field, but they really need to support capacity building of NGOs and civil society organizations. So we have been pressing that, and, and I think surely and uh, slowly but surely they're coming on board. Um, s second, um, uh, I have encouraged the, uh, we have encouraged the Korean CSOs to work with global um, uh, global NGOs and global CSO, uh, civil society organizations, to, to really network and bring the experience of other uh, NGOs from abroad, like Oxfam, to come to bear to, and to talk and engage and sometimes be a watchdog uh, against, the Korean, uh, against the government. Finally, I think the CSOs themselves have to become uh, much more transparent. They have to be subject to the same kind of evaluations and monitoring that we talk about for official development assistance. Unless they're able to do that, uh, I think they can be subject to a lot of uh, concern from the government and not the government not willing to support them using uh, some bad examples uh, and so on. So I think the CSOs uh, themselves have also to come to to the podium and to, to uh, improve their transparency and, and these other issues. Yeah, I, mean, I, I, can't, I can't emphasize that last point enough. I mean, I, I'm often very critical of um, businesses when they come up and tell stories about how wonderful their work is in development, and I say, where's the evidence? You've got a conflict of interest. Where are the impact studies? Who are you accountable to? But I think the civil society sector and the NGOs get away with a lot, actually, in this area, too. They have a conflict of interest, too, sometimes. They are not very transparent. They don't fund impact studies. Um, 
do they represent? So I think I think um, I completely second your point. Uh, Phil Batterham, University of Melbourne. Uh, fair trade is largely set outside the MDGs. It's not an agenda that has been um, high on government's agenda. They've not bought in or had much control. It's been largely energised by civil society. So I'd ask what difference would it make if governments did commit to fair trade and should it therefore be considered um, prominently as we move towards um, 2015? I, I think fair trade set a minimum expectation for companies now rather than optimal. I think what food and beverage companies, if I can just take that sector, are doing are thinking how do we use this inclusive business of creating shared value methodology to improve our profitability while empowering farmers and that's uh, tending towards a more stronger review of the value chain. And I absolutely agree that if governments, like the Myanmar government that's actually partnering with us, with Pepsi, and are wanting to see how Pepsi can change the way, the fundamental way in which the supply chain functions to disadvantage farmers, uh, I think that's an enormous opportunity for the government, business and NGOs to see uh, comprehensive change and fair trade's the minimum. Uh, well, I, I'd, I'd agree that it's it's part of the jigsaw, and it's interesting just to be uh, part of the discussion around um, international trade and um, you know the responsibilities of different countries in terms of looking after their own workers and producers and so on. Um, and I mean, it's a, it's a, it's an area that I I don't have expertise in, but. Uh, just seeing the, our little piece of action in relation to fair trade and what the potential is to link that more directly with some of our development work and, and also some of our advocacy work, I think it's an important part of the jigsaw. Um, I think it's I think it's um, it's part of the find your own way. I mean, I think I think it's really important for different countries to say how important that's going to be for them. But I, you know, I, I do a lot of work on food and nutrition and agriculture, and, and the more evidence I see, the more shocked I am, really. I'm a quite a naive person, I guess, but the more shocked I see, uh, the more shocked I get at um, the deliberate influencing for profit generation that you see, and the sophistication of it is extraordinary. Set against that, there is a lot of heterogeneity. There are a lot of, there's a lot of variability in, in that kind of behavior. So there's a recent article in The Lancet. There was a recent inde index done by the Global Alliance on Improved Nutrition. And there was a recent Save the Children report in the UK on, on breastfeeding. And it just documents an extraordinary, um, a extraordinary amount of energy is, is, is targeted towards ripping off consumers and generating profits number one. But number two, there's an extreme variability. Some companies are really responsible and really transparent about what they're doing and why they're doing it. So we have to somehow isolate and celebrate the good and, and incentivize everyone else to be better than they are. Hi, I'm Lisa Cameron. I'm the director of the Monash Centre for Development Economics. And I just have a question for you and me, or others may, may want to con um, comment. But I agree that I think the um, sustainable development goals need to be gendered. And I was wondering how you think that might look. Um, because I guess my question's motivated by a, re a recent trip I made to Nusa Tenggara Barat in um, Indonesia, where we were just wandering around villages talking to women. And if you look at the uh, statistics for Indonesia, women do pretty well. In fact, women are ahead of men in terms of university education and so forth. And even female-headed households do quite well in terms of income per capita. But when you speak to women in the villages, it quickly becomes clear that they don't have a lot of decision-making power within the household or within the village. And so trying to capture that in some kind of indicator or um, a sustainable development goal is quite challenging.
I uh, that's why I talk about education. Uh, what what was that? Education, employment, and empowerment, and it comes from the research that we've done in in Korea. Korea is kind of pathetic in this regard, uh, in terms of providing for education opportunities. We do very well, so girls outnumber boys in some of the uh, scholastic tests. Uh, we're very smart. Um, and in terms of college uh, education and so on, women are in par with men. In terms of um, the indicators that come out of UNDP and GDI, so we're ranked like 20, uh, 30, was it? No. 20 or 30 something. When we look at gender empowerment measurement, we go down to rank 60th, 64, I think. So in terms of providing opportunities for women, great. But when it comes to opportunities, to exercise what they have learned in school, we were pathetic. And then we go to the gender uh, gap index that came out of World Economic Forum 2012. Out of 135 countries, guess what we ranked? 101. That's really pathetic. Um, so from that experience, what, what I've noticed is that, uh, and it goes back to some of my concerns about MDGs, we provide opportunities. But opportunities and education is not enough. You need, then need jobs or places where they can work and use that knowledge to improve their lives and improve the lives of their uh, family and the community and their country and, and the world. And, 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 and if we don't have that, and if we don't allow these people to exercise and to work and then to be empowered to, make, to be able to make decisions about their lives and so on, it's not enough. So, so that's why I think using the Korean experience, I go back to the MDGs, it's not enough just to provide uh, the opportunities, but we have to go further in empowering uh, for us to, to, to achieve the goals of poverty reduction and uh, all the other goals that we mentioned. So if there is a way to put an empowerment in that puzzle, I, I would be very happy, and I'm pushing from my little corner to, to see that happen. Add to that. I'm, I'm, I'm jumping in on everyone else's questions, hijacking them. Um, that's because you're not asking me any questions. So. Um, the uh, I, I can tell the MDG on uh, on women's uh, on gender was designed by men. I can tell that. I mean, it's a very narrow goal. It's very um, I don't know utilitarian. It's not. It's not. It's completely. It says nothing about power, and it seems to me that. Gender should be throughout all the goals, whatever the goals are, and I think it's I think it's highly questionable whether there should be a separate vertical goal or whether you should think of a horizontal goal that cuts across all the others. That talks about autonomy to make decisions, autonomy to move, autonomy control over your body, control about education, about health, about a whole range of things. And I think I think the field has moved to be fair to those guys. I think the field of measurement of empowerment of women has moved on tremendously in the last 15 years. I'm afraid that's uh, all the time we've got for questions, but uh, we will be having um, uh, informal drinks afterwards. So if you've got some questions that you haven't had a chance to, to ask or discuss with, with the speakers, please use that opportunity. Um, I'm about to ask um, Professor Graham Brown to come and close, but I just want to do a quick summing up of, uh, of the session. Overall, I think, taking from what Lawrence told us at the beginning, I think trust and um, accountability are very much the the, the guiding uh, the, the guiding principles for any future um, development agenda or framework that the world agrees on. But the core principle has to be gender equality, as as Lawrence was just saying, and of course, as Unme has also um, pointed out, that that whole issue of gender equality needs to run through absolutely everything if we're going to achieve what we need to achieve. There has to be an emphasis on development partnership, a real lesson coming out of the Asian experience, but but more broadly as well. Um, we we need to be solutions focused. I think that's something that Helen made very clear in her presentation, but also the role of civil society as advocate and as facilitator uh, is a, is an enormously <clears throat> enormously important role. And finally, the 
the need to recognise the the convergence and the inclusive elements that we now see in terms of business's contribution to development. Now I'd like to hand over to Graham to, to wrap up. Um, my remarks will be very short indeed. But uh, and unfortunately, Professor Shield sent her apologies, so she's unable to close and thank you all for coming. So I'll include that in my remarks. Um, first of all, I think that we've all learnt a lot and had a very rich discussion, for which we're very grateful to all the contributors. I think the plurality of challenges and then the plurality of journeys and focused on solutions were themes throughout the day and I think set off well from the televised panel yesterday. I think from the questions about what's the role of academia in having a function like this and how we can contribute, we heard over and over again the cry for evidence, the cry for measurement. And I think that the last example on the foods, for example, that we just heard from Lawrence, this, what's happening in non-communicable disease in health and what's happening. There are some very powerful groups who want to make very few powerful statements about food and nutrition and we should constantly call for evidence and measurement to replace anecdote and opinion. And similarly the type of measures that we would want to see in these global goals, we need those measures of social inclusion that are about people having autonomy, about people having authority and a power to make decisions about their own lives that we can measure and by, by which we can judge impacts whether it be on disability, gender or other minority groups, to what extent are they socially included. I think from the point of view of putting together Asia and the Pacific it was interesting to have the contrast and thanks to the speakers and I sort of learnt that Australia's got a lot more to learn about how to work with our partners in the Asian century if we're going to be effective partners together addressing uh, joint problems regionally and globally. Um, we'll be very interested to hear um, feedback from members if they found this a useful e exercise and I certainly want to thank all of those who came from long distances to be here. It's such a star-studded list of visitors, I just sort of feel sad that we didn't have more time to get more of the reflections of such magnificent people such as we saw on panels. There was so much more we could all learn from them, so let's hope that the dialogue does go on for much longer beyond this. Um, event today. Um, I, my thanks um, certainly go to those who uh, brought the ideas together, the people like Anne-Marie O'Keefe particularly and Robin Davies who thought out the program and for thanking Robin particularly for coordinating the background papers and as to what next, Robin has agreed to write a report of the, the meeting. It won't be word by word but a more general document that will be not unlike um, his preliminary document and building upon that. I think we'll be um, uh, very, uh, I'd like to thank the people who, many of the practical arrangements, particularly from the Asia Foundation, thank you to Gordon Hine and Anthony Mulakala and Gia King who helped us in that regard and from Anne-Marie and helpers at Daloe and particularly those at ANU, Stephen Howes working with uh, Robin Davies but also uh, Mark Matthews and at a practical level, Jonathan Cheng and Macarena Rojas were very helpful. And from my side, Brooke and Melissa, thank you very, very much. And Caroline here at the Woodward Centre, we thank all of you for uh, very much about that. One missing link, we're very disappointed, but we were very conscious of the fact that the future is in the hands of the next generation. Our one uh, speaker, Samaho Did, who was to be on the panel yesterday, was unfortunately unwell and had to send her apologies. And so she's from the Global Poverty Project and would have been another wonderful contributor, I'm sure. I don't know what the average age is in, of the population in Asia or the average age is in the Pacific. Someone probably knows off the, off the head. My guess is it might be about half the average age of our panellists. And so <laughs> to balance that, I'd like to say and tell others the tremendous interest that was shown in this by students. At ANU and Melbourne University we put out a call which students would like to come. Within a couple of days I think we had 90, something like that, 40 and 50 at each of the institutions who had to write a two page reason as to why they would like to come, why they thought they might benefit from it and 
how they're going to use social media to send the message around development into the debate. So many of your comments are already hashtags, Twitters, websites, <laughs> social media, and whether you like it or not, the world may know some of your opinions that have gone. And so thank you very much to the students for their contribution. And they will continue to, they are the ones to take a future, maintain the rage and maintain the interest, which was a great part of what we are trying to do with this event. We'll be very interested to hear your um, feedback, whether it was useful, and I hope that all of you, you're all welcome to, I know some have to rush off, but to join us for a drink and after, afterwards to talk for a while before we go our separate ways. So thanks to all those who travelled a long way to come here and thanks to everybody for their contributions.